All right, today we're going to be creating what is kind of the basic intro animation that really everybody should create when they first start animating anything, when they first start working in After Effects or Maya. Uh, we're going to create a little bouncing ball, but in addition to that, we're also going to rig the ball so that it will move more realistically so that we can automate the rotation based on uh, its horizontal movement and so that we can set it up so it will squash and stretch and we can kind of uh, squash it when it hits the ground and stretch it out when it flies back up and make it look a little bit more realistic. So I'm going to start a new composition. This one I just set it at 12 seconds. I'm going to leave it at uh, HD here so I don't kill my computer trying to render out 4K. Uh, I'm going to create a new um, object or a new uh, shape layer. So I'm going to go to layer, new shape layer, and I'm going to click on add. We're going to add an ellipse. Click on add again. We're going to add a fill. We're going to change the fill color here to, I don't know, like a blue. Blue works well for this. We're going to make a little non-threatening little blue ball. This is already expanded, but if you don't see it expanded, you'll need to expand out your shape layer, expand out contents, expand out the ellipse path. And then we're just going to make the size of the shape layer a little bit bigger. We don't want to do this with scale because part of our rig is going to be incorporating changes to scale. So we're going to leave scale at 100% until we're uh, ready for that. So about there looks good. Collapse all this stuff. I'm going to go ahead and name this. So click on it and press enter. It's always good to name things, especially when you're scripting, which we are going to have to do a little bit of scripting to set up a rig. Hit control D to duplicate this. Again, press enter. I1 is going to be the name. I'm going to go ahead and change the color of this so we have like the white of the eye here. I'm going to open this one up, contents, ellipse path. It's the downfall of After Effects is that it's just to keep expanding all these little layers out. Uh, let's scroll in here a little bit. I'm using Alt and the mouse wheel to scroll in, and then I'm using the space bar to pan around like that. Now, we've got this eyeball. Let's actually make it just a little bit smaller. There we go. Okay, so there's our eyeball. I'm gonna collapse that stuff. I'm gonna hit Control D to duplicate. Let's make this the pupil. So the pupil now is selected and we just named it. I'm gonna change the color of that to black or like a dark gray. I'm gonna expand it out again. Expand out this particular one and we'll make the pupil a little bit smaller. All right. So there's, there's that, that looks pretty good. Now, I want this pupil to be parented to this eyeball and I want this eyeball to be parented to the ball. So I'm gonna set up my parenting relationships here before I start duplicating this out and making uh, the other uh, eyeball here. So to parent, we can either use this drop down or we can use this little pick whip thing. Uh, I'm just gonna click and drag the pick whip to the eye and then the eye has its own pick whip, which will then point to the ball. What we should have is that pupil is pointed to eye, eye is pointed to ball and then ball later we're going to parent to our rig. So now if I move the eye around, I'm going to go to my selection tool and move the eye, the pupil should go with it and if I hit control Z here to undo that. If I drag the ball around, the pupil should go with that. So I hit control Z to undo those. All right, so let's move the eye off over here to the left. Let's go to move the pupil off to the side so it's not just looking straight ahead at us creepily. Take both of those, Control D to duplicate. And if you have both of them selected, when you hit Control D, you'll see it says I2 and Pupil2, and it should bring those parenting uh, parenting relationships with it, where the I2, or the Pupil2, is now parented to I2, and the I2 is parented to Ball. If it doesn't, you'll want to double check and make sure that you get those parenting relationships correct. Pupil2 to I2, I2 to Ball, Pupil1 to I1, I1 to Ball, etc. All right, so I2, let's go ahead and move these over here. And just for fun, we'll move the pupil off to the side. So this guy looks kind of stupid. There we go. Classic case of dumbness is the eyes going different directions. And now finally, we're gonna make the rig for this. The rig, I'm just gonna right click in here and go to new and create a null object. Uh, quick fact, if you go to layer and go to new, these options you get here are the same things that if you right click in here and go to new, you get the same options. So this is just a little bit faster to find stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom back out on this. So click on the percentage of the viewport and set it to fit. Actually, it's a little bit too far away. So let's uh, move in a little bit. Okay, so this null object that we just created is kind of red rectangle. It shows up in the middle. That's gonna be our control for whether or not 
for how we kind of move this around. If it disappears, After Effects has a habit of hiding your control layers. If it does disappear at some point, you want to go into View and make sure to show layer controls. That way uh, we can see this little box. But at default, it should show up. All right, so we got Null. Let's press Enter and name it. It's going to be the rig. And we're just going to drag this down underneath the ball. So the ball and the rig are both kind of close together in our layer stack. Now, the rig and the ball, before I, I start setting up our parenting and our scripts and all that, the rig needs to be positioned where it's supposed to, it's supposed to be to control the ball. So I'm going to select the rig down here, and then I'm just going to click and drag it so it's kind of down right there, close to the bottom of the, the ball. All right, so there's our rig. It's positioned, and the rig is going to control the horizontal movement of the ball. The ball's rotation is going to be based on that horizontal movement. So the ball, we want it to rotate around its own center, right? And we want the rig, or we, we want the rig to control squash and stretch. Now if we just scale this, we do, I'm going to deselect this right now, uh, and scale my y value. You can see there's kind of a problem here when it squashes, say it, the the bottom of the ball hits the ground, it squashes, it's going to look like it's like jumping up into the air because it's it's squashing to its own center rather than squashing to the bottom. We want it to squash towards the null object down here. So that's what we need to set up with our squash and stretch. I'm going to go ahead and ch uh, turn that back on for scale. You don't want to change any of these settings. All right, so let's go ahead and open up rotation and start setting up our script for the auto rotate and then we'll set up our script for the squash and stretch rig this guy so we can animate the bouncing ball without having to add like a million keyframes the advantage of doing scripts even though they take a little bit of time to set up the advantage of them is that well first you can reuse scripts over and over and over again but second you know a few minutes setting up a script is nothing to the hours and hours and hours and days that you'll spend trying to tweak keyframes if i wanted to keyframe the rotation of this to bounce, oh my god, it would take forever. And it'll create this huge mess of keyframes with all these like timing dependencies. We don't want to do that. We want to automate this and kind of link these movements together so that we can quickly and easily manipulate our object, set up our, our timing and our keyframes and our animation, and let it worry about uh, linking those, those values together. That's really what a rig is, is just setting up uh, uh, something that will control your character so that you can focus on the animation and not have to worry about moving each shape or each polygon or each uh, object independently, in which case it would just take an, an insane amount of time to get anything done. Okay, so to start with, I'm going to go ahead and just type in our script and we'll pass the values in later. For this to work, we need to know the diameter. So I'm just going to put D equals, and I'm just going to end this with a semicolon. I like to kind of type out the variables that I, I'll need to know before I start passing values in, just so I can, can be sure that I've got the right syntax and the right flow. So D equals, and then end your variable declaration with a semicolon. We're also going to need to know the circumference, but before we know the circumference, we need to know pi. So I'm going to add a variable for pi. And I pulled this script from a website. Uh, Lester Banks has just an immense resource of, of these things. Another nice thing about scripts is that you don't have to memorize all of them, you can go online and you can, you can pretty much assuredly find a resource that's going to help you figure it out. Uh, and then in this case, I'm, I'm basing the script off of one from Lester Banks. Uh, so thanks, Lester Banks. Inside of After Effects, it's got some operations already here and some things ready to go. And one of them is math.py. So math.py will actually just call value of pi for you. You don't have to kind of round it down to 3.14 and you don't have to just type numbers forever. You can just do the math.py and it will pull that value for you. All right, so now we can find out the circumference. So c equals our d, it's our diameter, times. And in scripting, you use an asterisk for a multiplication. So c equals diameter times pi. c equals d times pi. Next, we're going to need our uh, movement, or uh, sorry, a rotation. And rotation is going to figure out how much of that circumference length is is distributed to each uh, section or each degree section, each of those 360 degrees. And we need to know that so we know what rate uh, this is going to rotate. So we're going to set up a rotation rate with 
I'm just going to type in arrow t as my variable. So rotation is going to equal uh, 360 times, or divided by, uh, diameter. I'm sorry, divided by circumference. So 360 divided by circumference. All right, next we need our movement. So this is going to link in the, the movement of our rig. The movement equals, and in this, we're going to be just linking the uh, uh, x position value of our uh, null object. So I'll leave that here. And I'm just putting these little pound signs as like a reminder that, oh right, I need to come back in here and add, add stuff later. And finally, we're gonna need our scalar. So and the scalar is going to just kind of keep it from changing. If we make the ball bigger and our circumference changes, we wanna factor that in. So if it scales up, then you know the circumference is gonna change. And unless we factor that in, then our rotation rate is gonna be wrong for the size of the, the ball. So new scalar, and that's going to be the uh, the scale of our object uh, divided by 100. So we'll pull in that value, the scale, and then divide it by 100. Then finally, we just need to add some math to this. So this is going to be movement times rotation divided by scalar. Again, you don't need to memorize what all of these are doing or memorize all the commands. You know, all this stuff is available online, so you can look that up as you go. But it's it's helpful to understand some of the basics of how this stuff works, so you can get in and start, uh, start really kind of working on it and figuring out your own scripts how they're going to work. So, diameter. Let's find the diameter. Now, the diameter is going to be controlled by the uh, that elliptical size of the ball. So if I open up contents for the ball, open up the ellipse path, uh, it's going to be the size that we want to pass in here. So I'm going to take that number sign, that's selected, I'm going to pick width up to size. Now I don't want to do size because that's going to pull in two numbers, we only want one. These numbers are linked together with a little keychain, so if I pick one of these, it's going to pull both of them together. So I'm just going to pick the x value, it's going to do content, ellipse, path, uh, one, uh, size, and then this little zero here in the brackets tells us that it's picking the x instead of the y dimension. All right, so next, if I can get this thing to scroll down. Next, we're going to need to uh, bring in the position of the rig. We're also going to need to look at the scale of the rig. So I'm going to hit P, hold Shift, and hold uh, hit S, and that'll open position and scale. This, for the ball, I'm just going to select the ball and hit R to bring up rotation again, expand this out. So this is kind of how we manage this and keep from having too many things showing up in our layers panel at any given time. All right, so math of pi, diameter times pi, and rotation is 360 divided by c. Movement here, we're gonna select that little pound sign, and we're gonna point that. Now this specifically needs to go to the x value. So there's x, there's y. We want this to be controlled by the, the horizontal movement, which is our x number right here. x is always first, y is always second, x, y, z, in that order. Now finally we need our scalar, so I'm gonna select the little pound sign for the scalar here, and we can pick whip and point that to scale. Now this one, again, doesn't matter as long as we don't do scale. We do scale, which brings in both numbers, but we just want one of these. So I'm gonna pick X. Again, these are tied together, so they will stay the same. So click out of this. Everything should work. It'll get rid of our little expression error thing that, that said it wasn't working. And if I click and drag on this position number, it is working. One key feature though is that we haven't parented this ball to the rig yet. So I need to select the ball, parent it to the rig. So in our little drop down, we'll parent it to the rig. And now, when we move the rig, it should also move along with the rig. So we've got a ball that rolls based on the movement of the rig. Perfect, okay. So let's collapse this here and let's set up our squishing uh, thing here. So for the squash, I'm going to create a slider controller. So in effects and presets, just type in slider. Sliders basically let us add controls to things so that we can kind of control different aspects of our animation. I'm going to add two of these. So just click and drag them onto the, the rig. I drag them down into the layers here because it's kind of hard to, to drop it on that little tiny point there. And then let's go ahead and name these. One of them is going to be for X and one of them is going to be for Y. So we'll call this squash 
x, and this one will be squash y. So again, to name these, you just click and then press enter and it opens up the, uh, the naming. Then press enter again to accept it. So squash x slider or squash y slider, perfect. Now we want the scale of this rig to be controlled by these sliders. We're gonna ultimately be controlling these independently. So we're gonna have the y scale like this, so it squishes down and we'll have the x scale like this, okay? So let's set this to 100. I'm not going to be messing with the X, so I really don't care about that, but we've got the slider there, so may as well. Uh, I'm going to hold Alt, click on this little stopwatch. We're going to expand this out, and we're going to start typing in our script for this. So the script for this is a little bit simpler. We just want to store a couple of variables and then enact those variables. So what we're doing here is we're storing the X and the Y separately, so then we can enact them separately rather than as one big thing. So to store them, we're going to do X equals semicolon and then y equals semicolon. So we've got our syntax already, so now I can just click in here, point this x up to squash x, and just point it to that slider. For y, same thing, but this time point it to this squash y slider. Now we're going to pass those variables in and actually do something with them. So in square brackets, we'll do x, comma, y. And now let's click out of there. Now it's given us this error. And if we dug in, we would see why is that it's it can't create a number from uh, our scalar or from our object. The reason is that these are both set to zero. If we scale these up, that expression error will go away and now we'll be able to see our object again. So let's set this to 100 and 100 for both of those. And now if I take this slider for Y and squish it, we'll be able to see this little ball squishing. Perfect. All right, so let's bring this down a little bit so we can see these a little bit more clearly. Let's zoom out on this, fit to screen. And I'm just gonna start with the rig's position. So I hit P to, to open position. And we're gonna grab this, drag it off to the side go all the way off until the ball just kind of disappears there. All right, so let's start keyframes. I'm going to click the little stopwatch to start recording keyframes. So it's going to record one at that position. We go down to three seconds and just drag this number way out. So it's over at the end of the, the screen. And then if we, I'm going to press N so it keeps repeating our work area. N is for this, this work area right here. So N key is in Nancy on your keyboard. So now we'll see it rotates. And we haven't had to keyframe any rotation. We just can keyframe the movement and it rotates realistically with the movement. Perfect. That is exactly what we need. Now we can start keyframing its bounces. It's a lot easier though to keyframe the bounces if we start with the point where it hits the ground. Because it's it's already on the ground. So we just go in, add our, our keyframes where it's going to hit the ground, and then we can go in and add the keyframes where it's going to be up in the air. We try to do the air and then back to the ground and air and back to the ground, it just it takes longer. So uh, we'll say probably it's going to hit the ground there. So I'm going to click this little diamond thing here to add a keyframe. We're going to move it a little bit forward. And as this bounces, it's going to start with big bounces, and then they're going to get smaller and faster as it goes. So this, we probably want maybe two-thirds of that. It depends on the material. If you have like a rubber bouncy ball, obviously it's going to bounce a lot more and a lot longer and a lot faster than like a big steel ball. We don't want this to be a bouncy ball or a steel ball, just somewhere in the middle. So we'll say it's right there. Go ahead and click. That's where it hits the ground again. So again, here about two-thirds of that. One more. And then finally, let's see. So we've got boing, boing, boing. And I'm just going to do four bounces. Let's say this is where it hits the ground and finally lands the last time. It's right there. So add my last keyframe in. All right, so it's going to be up in the air when it starts. So we'll go all the way back to the beginning. This keyframe is going to be our first kind of up in the air keyframe. And on this one, I'm going to decrease that Y value. With After Effects, the origin is up in the top left corner. So by decreasing the number, it moves it closer to the origin, which 
also means it's moving up. So lower numbers, higher in the composition. A little bit counterintuitive, but once you get used to it, it makes more sense. So like there, I guess, is fine. And it comes down and it hits the ground, and then we'll come about halfway between these. We're gonna raise it up again, but not quite as high this time. So about just like we did before, maybe a third or two thirds ish, and then it's gonna be a little bit lower this time. So this time it's gonna be maybe there. Actually, I'm thinking this this uh, second point in there maybe needs to be a little bit higher, so we can add this one. Maybe make it just a little bit higher. And you can tweak this and play with these values and uh, make it kind of perfect, but it's good to just go ahead and set this stuff up before you start trying to dial in the details, because we don't really know what it's going to look like until we've kind of set uh, everything up. All right, so if we play this at this point, it's going to look stupid. It's going to look like it's kind of rolling over this roller coaster. And the reason is because our interpolation is kind of messed up. So we need to uh, let's go back and look at this. Normally a ball is going to travel in an arc. It's going to hit the ground hard, and then it's going to kind of arc up, slow down towards the top, and then kind of accelerate back down towards the ground, and then each time, you know, once it gets up to here, its upward momentum is getting completely uh, counteracted, so it's going to be moving at zero, essentially, and then accelerate again back down to the ground. So we want that kind of sense of it's like coming up, and pausing, and then accelerating again, and then it's, you know, that's why our our motion gets less and less each time because it's it's really just the, the leftover force that's going into the ball. Other forces of that are going into the floor and into the squash of the ball, so kind of energy just kind of dissipates over time. I've set these all up really close to the end, but we'll look at once we start doing our interpolation, stuff is going to move around a little bit. These keyframes are going to get spread out a little bit more. So to mess with interpolation, you want to open the graph editor. And for this, you're going to want to be in the value graph. It's The speed graph isn't quite going to do it. I'm going to zoom in on this just a bit so we can kind of see this a little bit better. All right, so we've got the red line is our x value. So that's the one moving across. And then the green line is our y value as it's going up and down. I want to separate these out. There's this little button right here called separate dimensions. And we want our x value. It should really just be this nice clean arc. So I can actually now delete all these keyframes that were created on the x dimension when we added keyframes for the bounce. We just want the x to be controlled by these two keyframes at the beginning and the end. So we get this nice gradual arc. So it's going to move, kind of, kind of decrease in speed over time. You can see what I'm talking about. It kind of spreads these, these keyframes out a little bit. All right, so now that we've got that set up, I'm just going to click on the Y position so we're not looking at the X anymore. And then I can kind of start to tweak some of these. I can tweak these here or in the uh, editor. I like to kind of tweak them here. It makes it a little bit easier to see what we're doing. We can also uh, go back into this one and, and kind of tweak these a little bit, move them back if we want to. And just kind of tweak the, the positions of these. And let's move that out a little bit. I'm going to move these back just a bit, and this one back just a bit. There we go. So we can kind of tweak our, our timing of this. Let's go back into our graph editor, select the Y position again, so now we can see all these. All right, so with this Y value. What we're seeing is the peaks here are where it's hitting the ground, and the valleys are where it's up in the air. Again, counterintuitive, but remember, as this number decreases, it's getting closer to origin. So the closer it gets to zero, the higher up on the screen it's going to get. So that's why these little valleys on our graph actually correspond to the peaks in our animation. So what I want to do first is I want to select all these ones that are on the ground, and to get that kind of hard hit where it like hits the ground really hard, uh, we don't want it to kind of to, to ease in there. We don't want it to slow down or change direction when it gets to those. We just want it to go straight in when it hits the ground. We got these little handles on all these. And that's because right now they're they're Bezier handles. What I'm going to do with all those selected is click this little button down here. It says convert selected keyframes to linear, and we'll get rid of those little handles and just treat them as as hard corner points, kind of like corners in Illustrator. The next thing I'm going to do is select all of these valley points here. 
and we're going to turn those into easy ease keyframes. That'll just spread out those little handles. And so now we're starting to get those arcs that we're looking for. The first one's looking pretty good. I think the second one probably could stand to be a little bit rounder. So we'll drag these handles out here. It's easier to control if you zoom in. So I'm gonna hold Alt and zoom in spacebar to kind of pan around here, just like you would in the viewer. If you're going to keep these perfectly straight, you can drag and hold shift. I'll drag them straight out. You can also move these around a little bit. So I'm going to move that one back just a bit. I'm going to move this one back also just to, well, maybe not that far back. Well, I guess that one we're just going to leave it where it is. All right. And then this, we're going to round it out just a bit. All right, so now when we watch our ball bouncing, it looks a lot more like a ball that's kind of losing speed as it goes, and it's kind of decreasing in momentum as it goes. It's losing a lot to bounce and to the roll, but it still looks really, really hard, and that's because we haven't done our squash yet. Now, you can spend a lot of time tweaking these. For the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of leave it as is. It'll be not quite perfect, but close enough. So now let's go ahead and uh, change the squash. The squash Y is the only one I'm going to change. I'm not going to worry about the squash X. So I'm the keyframe squash Y. So we'll turn on the little stopwatch. To show all the keyframes that are currently or all the properties that have keyframes, press U on the keyboard. And that will open up everything that currently has keyframe properties. Now, when I created this keyframe, when I started recording, I had the slider a little bit forward in time. So I'm just going to drag that keyframe back to the beginning. It creates keyframes wherever your slider happens to be. So that's really... Uh, you want to control that. So first thing I want to do is I want to go find where this this ball hits the ground first. I don't want to immediately squash it here because what's going to happen is that it's going to squash the entire kind of time that it's traveling from here. We want it to squash instantly as soon as it hits the ground. So I'm going to go find that point right there and then step back one frame and set another keyframe that's going to store this this value of like a hundred percent. Then Let's go back to the squashing keyframe. We can squish this down so it only squishes as soon as it hits the floor. And we'll squash that down to like 60. We'll go to the next one up here, say a couple of keyframes later, and we'll go ahead and set this actually back up a little bit over 100. So as a, a ball kind of bounces in the air, it actually, when it squishes, it'll it'll kind of expand and contract. So we'll go past 100. And we'll go back down to where it hits the ground again, step back a keyframe, we'll set it back to 100 here. So by the time it hits the ground again, it's going to return to its normal size. Then on this next keyframe, where it actually hits the ground, we'll go ahead and scale this down. Now this time, I don't want to scale it down quite as much, so I'm going to scale it down to like 60-something instead of in the 50s. We can actually go back, let's see how much I scaled it. Yeah, 61 the first time, this time it's 67. Let's go ahead and make it like 70 something. So it doesn't squish quite as much. It wasn't, um, the force wasn't as great, so it shouldn't squish quite as much. We'll go ahead, a couple of keyframes, and let this thing come back up to like 109. So it, it does kind of get a little bit too big. We'll go to where it hits the ground again, step back one more keyframe, set it to 100 go to where it hits the ground and we'll scale this down again this time to like 80 something because we don't want it to squish too much and then forward a couple of frames we'll make it like 103 and then we'll come down here to where it's about to hit the ground again set back one frame set it to 100 again and then here where it actually hits the ground we'll set it to uh, I don't know like 95 and then in the last one, we'll just move it ahead a couple of keyframes, and we will bring this back up to 100. All right, so and you can see it's writing those keyframes for me as it goes. So now if we scroll through this, we can see it kind of frame by frame. It hits, squishes, it gets stretched out. It hits and squishes and gets stretched out, and hits and squishes and gets stretched out. And that squash is less and less with each one of these. That very first impact being the biggest gets us the biggest squish. And let's go ahead and jump out here. Move this down and we'll press spacebar to play it. And there's our bouncing ball animation. We can turn on 
motion blur if you want. So here we've got this little motion blur checkbox. If you don't see that, toggle switches and modes so you can see your little checkboxes here. Turn on motion blur, it'll make it look a little bit better. And then when you want to render it out, you can go up to composition. And then if you want to render it out as like an AVI or an MOV, like an uncompressed, you can add to render queue. If you want to render it out for YouTube or uh, for you know web sharing stuff like a compressed smaller file, you can go to add to media encoder queue and you'll have all the presets in there. So I hope that's been helpful and I will see you in the next.